Welcome to Disruption Now. I'm your host and moderator, Rob Richardson. As always, if you're watching us on YouTube, please hit that like button, please subscribe, so you can continue to learn about everything we bring out, all the new videos and all the content we bring out. If you're listening to us on podcasts, if it's Apple Podcasts, if it's Google Play, or however you listen to us, please subscribe. Uh, please write us a review. That's how more people can learn about us, we, so, so we can move up and more people can be exposed and engaged to, the, to disruption, because we all know we need more disruption right now in our current political environment. Uh, but today, we are honored to have Maxine Waters. Maxine Waters... What you may not know about her, you know a lot about her, at least you know, you may call her Auntie Maxine, like I do. But what you may not know is her journey here. We want to talk about that in the current political environment. She is five of 13 children. She was raised uh, uh, with, uh, by a single mother. She was the fifth of 13 kids. She grew up poor, but not poor in spirit. She always worked. She started working at age 13 in a segregated, res in a segregated restaurant in Jim Crow South. Never let that dampen her spirits, moving to LA, continue to work. Work, worked in a factory, worked her way up in school, and then she decided to get involved in politics, and politics in this country would never be the same. She, can, she continues to fight, she continues to work, she continues to make history. She is now the first woman and the first African American to ever chair the House Financial Services Committee. And you're gonna see, she's not afraid to use that gavel, she is not afraid to use that power. Just take a look. This is a new way and it's a new day, okay, well, and it's a new chair, okay, and well, I have the gavel at this point. If you wish to leave, you may. You, what would you I, like to do? What I've told you is I thought it was respectful that you'd let me leave at 5.15. You are which free is to leave any time you want. You may okay, go well, then, uh, anytime please, you want. Please, please dismiss everybody. I believe you're supposed to take the gavel and, and bang it. That's Please do not instruct me as to how I am to conduct this committee. I, I, don't I, I, tell I me that we don't understand. That's the, the gentle, attitude that's been given toward women suspend, time and time again. The gentlelady will suspend. The chair wishes to remind all members that they are to address their remarks to the chair. I respect will the continue. chair, but don't stop me in the middle when you didn't stop him in the middle. And so I shall continue. Don't you dare talk to me like that. Congresswoman Maxine Waters. Hello. Hello, Congresswoman Waters. How are you? Fine, fine, fine. How are you? Hey, I can't complain. I, I really appreciate you coming on. Okay, I'm delighted. Let's go with it. All right. So just want to just actually get to a little bit of background. Uh, so you're the fifth out of 13 children raised by a single mother and uh just doing some uh, background on you 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 your first job was at a at, at a segregated restaurant that's the first place you that's right that's that, right and um you know take yourself back to that moment what did you want to be when you were when you grew up and what do you want to be now Oh, I, I don't know. Uh, I was raised in St. Louis, uh, you know, with a large family, as uh, you indicated. And um, I uh, attended schools where we had very caring and supportive teachers who were involved in our lives. And um, they were, you know, very encouraging. And um, they, they did everything in their power to uh, expose us uh, to you know, everything that they could through some travel and uh, the um, opportunities that they provided for us to join the, you know, human relations clubs and various kinds of uh, uh, clubs and activities that would help us to grow and develop. Uh, I had, um, you know, a strong, um, you know, community of support. Sure. Uh, uh, aside from the teachers, we, we lived in a poor but supportive community. And, uh, you know, we always knew that we wanted to go to college. Uh, we always knew that we wanted to have a professional career. I aspired to be a social worker okay. uh, because I had seen social workers in the community. I thought they were very powerful people. They determined whether or not people were eligible uh, for welfare, and they could put them on and they could cut them off. And I thought that's, that's what I would like to be. Um, and so <clears throat> my life has been one of uh, raising a family. I have uh, two kids, uh, two, two adults and two grandchildren. And um, I have uh, worked, um, you know, at various jobs uh, leading to um, my jobs and career in public service, uh, Head Start was one of the most defining uh, activities in my life. I worked starting as an assistant teacher and went on to be the supervisor of parent involvement and volunteer services. The war on poverty came about. 
uh, creating that and other programs in the community, which helped to really, uh, you know, politicize me even more. And I went from uh, working uh, in Head Start and um, developing and working with parents to um, working and for a city council person that I you know, helped to elect to office and other campaigns, became a campaign manager until uh, 1976 when I first ran for office uh, at the height of the women's movement. Uh, working with, you know, Gloria Steinem and Bella Abzug and Patsy Mink and all the women who were the pioneers uh, in the women's movement, which then led me to run for office uh, at that time with the help of a National Organization for Women and WPC, local women in the community who were involved in uh, programs dealing with education and poverty. And uh, from that point on, uh, the opportunity presented itself to run for Congress, and after 14 years of, um, of all of the kind of uh, work that I was doing and, you know, my involvement with community organizations and with the growing, uh, burgeoning women's movement, women's movement, I was elected to Congress uh, to uh, basically... Um, uh, deal with a community that at that time uh, was basically, for the most part, African American. Right. Uh, with uh, some small parts of it being uh, uh, poor or, or working class whites and uh, some Latinos. And over the years, uh, that began to change. And since I've been in Congress, it has changed substantially through reapportionment. I now have about 22% African Americans in my district. I didn't know it was that low in terms of uh, proportion of African Americans. I thought it was higher. That's interesting. No, 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 no. That's all I have. Then uh, the rest, about 46% Latino, 15% Asian, and the rest are white. Yeah. Okay. No. So you're 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 a strong, proud Black woman, as you've said many time times. But you uh, you know, in, in a world that doesn't always understand or appreciate that. How do you block out the negativity and and not let that affect how you present yourself when so many people attack you? You know, you've been attacked by the right. I'm sure you've probably been even attacked by people in, in, in the Democratic Party. Probably. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm attacked all the time. Uh, uh, despite that, I do have a lot of support, you know, around the country and strong support in my district. Uh, Millennials love you, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And uh, no, I've never been stymied uh, by criticism or attacks. Uh, and I don't know where that comes from, uh, but uh, I've been able uh, to basically not, that, not allow those kinds of attacks to interfere with my work and uh, to resist it, uh, to, uh, to push back. And sometimes that takes confrontation, and I'm willing to do that. Uh, it's almost uh, natural for me uh, to to deal with justice and fairness and uh, to resist uh, the efforts and attempts by people to undermine uh, the most vulnerable in our society and disregard and disrespect and all of that. And so it's my life. This is what I do. And uh, this is what I've been doing, of course, for many, many years. And I am now confronted. Uh, with the President of the United States, the likes of which I've never seen before in my entire life. And that's saying a lot, because you've think, seen a lot. <laughs> no, yes, this President doesn't deserve uh, to be called President, doesn't deserve the presidency, and has um, no respect or understanding of the Constitution of the United States of America. He's alienating our allies and about to get us into war with Iran right now. But I am now the chair of the Financial Services Committee, and I am uh, dealing with some of a part of this investigation that's an oversight that I have the responsibility for in this committee. And I have subpoenaed his uh, papers and um, financial uh, information from Deutsche Bank and we will, uh, he has sued Deutsche Bank to try and stop them from giving me the underlying documents that I need. And we will be in court on Wednesday in New York uh, with the court taking a look 
at our request and making some decisions. Well, that's yeah. the, uh, that, that actually brings me to a, to, a, to a question that I want to talk about here. When you you've been very clear on this president, you've been clear on his abuse of power. You've been clear that you think there's already enough for impeachment. I, I tend to agree with you. And, and, I, and I believe most Democrats and many Americans understand that. But let's, let's talk about Democrats in power in the House. I believe, and I could be wrong on this, but it seems to be like there's some calculation that there, there, there's some concern about the political consequence of possibly pursuing impeachment. But isn't there a thought process, and I, and I think you're, you're, you're saying this, uh, what about not pursuing it and allowing this to be set as precedent to say this is okay? You know, once you say the rule of law no longer counts, then what is he allowed to get away with? Can he just reject what the court says? Can he just reject the election results? I mean... Isn't there, isn't, there, isn't, there, isn't there something to actually pursuing this to make sure that we pursue it in a way where people can understand that we're fighting for the rule of law and being really clear about that? I think there's danger in not doing that. What's your thoughts on that? And how can we get, I think, Democrats to at least, I think, try to understand well, yeah, that? yeah, I think that you have but just summed it up uh, quite accurately. Uh, yes, there is a belief that somehow if we move to impeachment, that it's going to embolden his... Uh, uh, supporters and that uh, we will not do well in 2020 uh, because they will uh, come out in huge numbers uh, in response to impeachment. But, you know, my answer to that is he has a consistent uh, base yep. of supporters they're, and they're, they're going to come out. They're, anyway. coming. they're yeah. coming. He's a master of, he's, right. he's a horrible president, but he's a master yeah. of getting his base motivated. They're coming one That's way right. or the other. <laughs> So I, I completely so, agree with that. Yeah, they're going to come out anyway. And But I think what you uh, just alluded to is extremely important. If this president can get away with misusing the powers of the president through his executive orders, uh, disregarding uh, the House of Representatives and uh, basically instructing uh, the folks in his administration uh, to resist uh, the invitations to come and testify, uh, resisting subpoenas, uh, disregarding the Constitution. Uh, if this continues and if he wins with this, we will have changed government forever and the rule of law. We will have done a great disservice Absolutely. Uh, to the people of this country. And I feel that very strongly. Uh, and so I do resist him. And I, I've said for a long time, uh, that he needed to be impeached long before people were willing to even hear the words. But I wanted to create that conversation. And as it turns out, uh, because this president has been uh, so outrageous and so ridiculous and so in violation of, uh, of uh, the law uh, and precedent and everything else, that uh, people are now talking about impeachment in various ways. Yes. You hear more about it from the media. You hear uh, more people saying they think it's time, particularly after the Mueller report, where the attorney general lied about what was in the report. Completely lied. I read acting, it. Yes. Acting as if he is the attorney for the president of the United States. Uh, more people began to consider impeachment as the answer. And I feel this way. Uh, even though people say, well, you don't have the support of the Senate. You don't know whether you have the support That's of correct. the Senate until you, you get started with it, introduce it, and start laying out the information. And uh, people are not going to read that report. No, nobody's going to read it for the page. I did, no. but I'm, I'm a nerd. But you're absolutely right. <laughs> I mean, you are so right. I just, I just wanted to say this was point, and then I want to let you get back to your point. We have to do this because it's very simple. Um, if we don't, then we don't really have a rule of law. We don't have a rule of law. So and this is not a hard conversation. Just tell folks, if you believe in the Constitution, which uh, you know those on the other side say that they do, this is not hard. Either you believe in the rule of law, you believe in the Constitution, that's what we're protecting. That's one. Two, to your point, I'm a lawyer. You never know what comes out in trial. You got to have the trial that's first. Right. That's right. That's right. And I want to tell you, for the President of the United States to disregard the fact that Russia hacked into our Democratic National Committee, the Republican National Committee also, and into some of the state's election systems, to never criticize him, to never put anything in force or initiate any retaliation for that, 
is unbelievable. And the question arises, what do they have on him? Why is it he is so tied to the Kremlin and to Putin and the oligarchs of Russia? Um, those are questions that have to be answered. Absolutely. And this investigation that was started by the FBI recognized that this was a person running for president who they believe could be compromised already. And so now this president has the attorney general investigating the FBI for starting the investigation in the first place. <laughs> and this is outrageous in the way that he has managed to literally put in place uh, not only the attorney general, but Kavanaugh, for example, who things that will go up to the Supreme Court, he will have the protection of uh, Kavanaugh sitting there doing his bidding. And so this president is way off uh, the scale in terms of uh, being uh, just a dishonest uh, individual, immoral individual, an individual who does not care about anybody but himself and is willing to do whatever it takes for him to be able to wield power and to um, resist being in compliance with basic law and with basic practice, not showing his tax return, th thumbing his nose at us, and then suing uh, the chairperson of oversight and investigations, Mr. Cummings, because he's requesting documents, uh, telling his people not right. to appear, suing the bank, suing Deutsche Bank, yeah. and telling them not to give us the documents. He is outrageous. Uh, but I think all of this is I getting think, down to the fact yeah. that if he can do this, then we're saying that, you know, if you don't, if you think that this is okay, then you're not a believer in the Constitution. You're not a believer in, in the American principles that you say you believe in. And so, you know, my message to folks is, do we believe in the rule of law? Do you believe in the Constitution? This is, this is like, this is not about, this is not a debate about policy. This is a debate about America. And if you believe in the ideals yes, of America, is. if you believe in the Constitution, yes. this is not hard. It is, a president cannot, uh, you know, cannot, cannot not respond to Congress. Congress's job is oversight. That is literally written into the Constitution. Like, right. All of this was contemplated by the founders. And so what I hope Democrats understand is that, you know, Republicans right now are being complicit because of groupthink. But in a way, if Democrats aren't willing to have the courage to go forward, I think there are two consequences. One, there's the long term consequence, as you, as you said over and over again. And we make clear this becomes precedent. He becomes more emboldened. We get to pretty much uh, not all, not only water down, but I think change the rule of law. And then maybe we don't have a rule of law, but I think they actually help him politically too. Because if you're not making it an issue, he's going to frame it as he already is that. This is just a witch hunt. And if we're not doing anything to make yeah. sure that we are laying out the facts in a way that I think you can do it in a neutral way. Repeating over and over again, this is the rule of law, this is the Constitution, this is what we're protecting. All we're asking the president to do is comply. And when he doesn't, you have to, he's forced you to start the proceedings, because I don't know what other leverage you have, but that's just me. Well, the Constitution says uh, that the Congress of the United States uh, have the ability to impeach. And it speaks in general language about high crimes and misdemeanors, but it's whatever the Congress of the United States decides yep. about an unfit person in that seat. We have the ability to impeach him. To get the and obligation. that is the final safeguard Absolutely. in our democracy. Completely agree. I want to talk about another abuse of power he he's he's doing. When you looked at you spoke up you spoken up about this. Uh, you know the uh, uh, housing and uh, urban development has looked to target families that might have undocumented workers, but otherwise has legal citizens living in there. If you have family members, sometimes they might have someone who is uh, an undocumented worker or in the country, not legally. They're going after people who are citizens. At the same time, what really worries me, Congresswoman, is that they're combining that with the census question for citizenship. I believe the goal is to make sure that those people who are legal citizens do not respond or intimidate it. Therefore, uh, more resources goes to other areas. You know, has that been put together? Is there any thought about how we're going to push back? Because that, that really worries me. Maybe I'm over. Well, there are several things that uh, you have just talked about. And number one is I just heard today that there is a belief that we're going to lose on the citizenship question for um, 
you know, the uh, census and that uh, it's going to remain. Uh, and that's, that's so unfortunate. The other thing that you just talked about is this uh, mixed uh, immigration uh, issue that has been brought out by Ben Carson in this administration, where basically uh, a documented uh, uh, immigrant could have his family uh, join them uh, in, say, public housing. Uh, and now they're saying no, that that mixed immigration uh, effort that was put place a long time ago to keep families together was now going to be undone. And that I guess we're talking about, I don't know, 50, 60,000 children. 55,000, yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, be put on the street. And so but I think um, it's part of a targeted know, effort. Those two together, if I can, Congresswoman, I think the citizenship, que the citizenship question in combination with that is part of a plan to make sure that they don't maybe don't vote, don't come out and, and answer the census question. Maybe I'm just uh, being uh, paranoid here. No, but that no, seems no, to no. Be I think uh, no, I know. I know. No, I think you're being very logical. Uh, you know, they're about to knock out a lot of votes. Uh, and part of his uh, the strategy, I believe, is, number one, to, again, embolden his supporters, knock out um, all of those folks they can knock out, and further uh, discourage uh, African Americans through these voter suppression laws that are popping up in many of these southern states. And so they're going for the juggler they are. Uh, on all of this. And we... I don't think are responding forcefully enough, I and I hope agree. that people don't get disgusted and discouraged with us uh, because they don't think that we're fighting hard enough. Uh, I do believe that we should be tougher and that we should take up impeachment. I do believe that. Well, thank you, and I, I completely uh, agree with you because I don't see what the alternative is. Is it just to, what? what is it? Are we going to say he's corrupt but then not do impeachment? I just don't understand the strategy there, but um, I'm so glad you're there to help fight for us. Let, let's let's talk a little bit about what you want to do as the chairperson of the of the House Financial Services Committee. Uh, you know, what's your agenda there, given the fact that you, you do have now, you do have the gavel, and I know you're not afraid to use that gavel because I, I know you. Yes, yes, yes. Well, uh, I have a big bill that's going to come up next week. It's called Consumer First. And what I'm doing is I'm restoring the financial services um, uh, CFPB, uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, because when this and, president and that was started under just put, just so people know the consumer financial protection bureau was started to make sure that people are protected from wall street from consumer that's uh, right from it discriminatory was really the lending. brainchild of elizabeth warren correct uh and it became a central part of the dodd frank reform legislation i served on the as a conferee on the conference committee and, and the Dodd Frank, you know, sorry to interrupt you, just just to make the listeners know, that is the bill that was there to to fight back the abuses from Wall Street that led to the Great Recession. So that's to make sure we yeah. have protections it, in place. But what happened with the Dodd Frank reform is because of the meltdown that we had, uh, you know, in financial services, and what happened, you know, uh, with the banks uh, and their practices being revealed. Uh, that have to cause uh, this recession that was created. We took a look at uh, financial services overall, discovering that really consumers had nobody speaking up for them, uh, that uh, consumers were being left uh, to fend for themselves without the advocacy and the support that was supposed to be in our government agencies. And so the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is what, was organized in order to deal with the fact that consumers out there were being ripped off, payday loan people were charging for 500% interest, that student loans were, you know, in trouble, and that automobile industry was uh, targeting uh, African-American communities for higher rent interest rates, uh, uh, on and on and on. And so that's what that was all about. That's what that was organized for, to deal with protection for consumers. And uh, the first director that we had, Mr. Cordray, yes. did a good job. I know Cordray, obviously. Job. Yes. 
And then he left to run for governor, and uh, and the uh, president was in, and he uh, took Mulvaney and put him uh, there. And Mulvaney's job, his mission was to destroy the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and he took a lot of steps in doing that, starting with getting rid of the advisory committee, undoing many of the laws and practices that have been put in place. And now that we're back in power, I'm restoring all of that. And I hope that uh, we can get uh, support from the Senate side uh, to do what needs to be done in order to restore uh, the financial, uh, the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So that's one of the things that I'm working on. That's one of my high targets. Uh, in addition to that, I'm, Calling in the big banks, I had uh, 10 of them in uh, for hearings uh, in my committee uh, to talk about a number of things. I really wanted to impress on them that you have been committing uh, all kind of fraud and you've been fined over and over again, but the day is over when the cost of fines is just going to be a fact of doing business. That's over. And we talked with them about the, some of the practices uh, that had been employed uh, during the time of the cri crisis and making it known that we certainly did not intend to go back because we understood that creeping back into the system was some of the very products uh, that we had fought against and we thought we had gotten rid of. And so uh, we absolutely put the pressure on Wells Fargo and the CEO quit two days after he had come here uh, because they have a history of uh, not only creating accounts in. Uh, oh, you got him to name. quit. Listen to that. Wow. <laughs> yeah, he left. He left. Uh, and Bank of America, right before coming in here, they increase their pay from um, $15 an hour to $20 an hour. The rest of them came in talking about diversity and inclusion because I created a subcommittee on diversity and inclusion, made them know this is a big priority of mine. And they are now, um, you know, talking about and designing uh, diversity programs and agreeing that they have to do better with it, that they had not, you know, in the past paid attention to it. So we were dealing, we were dealing with all of those issues with the banks, with the financial services community. Um, this, uh, diversity and inclusion is extremely important. If you take a look at uh, what has been happening uh, with the banks and the private sector and with government and the federal government with things such as asset managers where you don't see any people who look like me, uh, that we are opening up these opportunities for African Americans and others, you know, to get not only considered, but to be contracted with and to be employed uh, in ways that they have not done before. So those are some of the things that we're working on. I have three big bills that are coming up. Uh, one is the National Flood Insurance Program. I have to get that reauthorized, and I want it to be author reauthorized, but it has got to be affordable. We cannot expect to have people pay premiums to deal with all of these natural disasters that we have. The premiums would cost more than your mortgage costs on your house. So we're working to keep those premiums down. Uh, and I would love to be able to, and I'm working on forgiving the debt that is being carried by the National Flood Insurance Program in FEMA. Uh, so we're also working on something known as XM Bank, which is our bank that does ex exporting uh, so that we can create more jobs uh, because we're able to sell our goods and services more uh, to more countries. And then I'm working on TRIA. Uh, and TRIA is basically the insurance program that we have that will support uh, big uh, venues that may get wrecked, lost uh, in the case of a disaster. If you have, you know, maybe, you know, hospitals, public hospitals, or you have venues that, you know, they would never be able to afford premiums that would restore, you know, all of this. And insurance companies would never be able to do all of that. So we have a way of uh, working with the insurance it's company. A lot of, to it's a lot of stuff going on there. Certain venues get restored. Yes. Uh, I, I want to just uh, shift gears as we get ready to conclude and just, just uh, ask you a few kind of questions I always ask uh, 
uh, folks that come on Disruption Now. So let's say you got a you have a committee of three, living or dead, that can be your advisors. They can be alive or be a mixture thereof, dead. Who would you choose of those three and why? Living or dead, well, you know I was very close to Shirley Tism. And uh, I like the fact that she was bold, that she, you know, created uh, what is oftentimes repeated over and over uh, about not being bossed, um, unbought and unbossed. Uh, and I carry that with me uh, in what I do uh, to not only. I think she said also, if they don't give you a seat, you bring a folding chair. Was that her? I think it was. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, I um, I look to you know I I look to and you know we had the uh, NAACP uh, defense uh, organization that dealt with reapportionment and dealt with you know going into court uh, to ensure that. Uh, to the best of their ability, that the gerrymandering that kept us out uh, from being uh, elected to districts that uh, we should have been elected to. So I think I would kind of look, I always believe in using the law uh, to the best of your ability to try and correct things in the law. And even though we've had periods in histories and times when the law didn't work for us, uh, we've had times when the law has certainly worked for us uh, because we had uh, we had uh, well-meaning people sitting in um, p in position uh, to to um, uh, to make the law work for us. So I believe in using the law, and whether it's the Legal Defense Fund or it's the ACLU or it is um, you know some of our poverty law. Uh, organizations, I believe that they are very important uh, to help uh, with equal justice under the law and to, you know, uh, fixes uh, that need to be done in the law. So I have a number of those uh, that I that I always deal with. But you said Shirley Chisholm was one, and it was your, I'm sorry, you had two others. We have Shirley Chisholm as an individual. We have the law and law organizations that I think have been very good okay. uh, for dealing with, uh, you know, uh, strengthening laws, straightening out laws and creating laws that need to be created. And then I like to listen to, um, even though, you know, I am certainly an elder, I like to listen to Seasoned. the older people who talk about uh, what they have learned in life, how they have survived, what they experienced, and uh, what they think I can do or should be doing, and to help me sometimes figure out the best path uh, to getting things done. And so those that's my basic uh, support kind of element that I have lived with, but I am a listener. And I listen to people. And even though I disagree uh, with uh, the big banks and, uh, you know, some of our corporations, my door is open. My door is open. Everybody can come in here. And in the final analysis, I'll tell you uh, if I can work with you. And I feel that uh, we have a like philosophy about life and getting things done. But if I don't like what you're doing, I will tell you that. <laughs> yeah. So final question and I on will this. Not work, work with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're very honest. I know I got the first time I met with you and that's what I appreciate you, Auntie Maxine. <laughs> Last question here. Billboard. Yeah. Let's say there's a billboard that's up that summarizes the belief of Maxine Waters. What does that billboard say and why? Oh, um, she fights for all of us. That that's been my um, that's been my logo. Uh, she, everything in all of my literature over the years is she fights for all of us, and people have uh, have you know embraced that, and they see me as a fighter, and they see me as someone who will stand up for them. And even though I represent a congressional district. 
we have, you know, solved cases and worked with people all over this country. And I learned how to do loan modification and confront the banks when they were foreclosing on homes and save people's homes. So people, people come to me uh, because they believe I will fight for them and that I have courage and I don't have fear and I'm, I don't feel intimidated. Uh, I don't act like a victim. And this is what that billboard would say. She, she fights for all of us. Amen. And I can say that that's the truth. We see you fighting everywhere. You're not just fighting for your area. You are fighting all across the country. You're fighting to protect our Constitution. I just want to tell you that I'm thankful that you're doing that. I appreciate you coming on and look forward to seeing you again in the future. Congresswoman Maxine well, Waters. Thank you so very much. And thank you for your patience. I want to be available to you. So work with um, my staff so that the Rakia and all can keep us uh, uh, involved with doing broadcasts when you think it's important to do. And I just thank you for the opportunity for doing this. I really, really, really appreciate it. You're so welcome and thank you. Best wishes. Thank you so much. That was Congresswoman Maxine Waters. As she told you, stay involved, get involved. Eternal vigilance is the price of freedom. Stay woke if you want to stay free. I'm Rob Richardson. I'll see you next time on Disruption Now.